Hey y'all, so this is going to be a video about how to build a college list. It's going to be pretty basic. I'll, I'll try my best to cover enough of a gamut for uh, you viewers to, to have a good understanding of what you got to be thinking of. The truth of the matter is it's pretty personal. There's going to be a lot of um, variability in what I would recommend to a student, uh, whether it's like a particular academic situation uh, testing situation even, uh, financial situation for family. Uh, but you know what? I'm going to try to try to make this happen. So let's get started. How to build a college list. A guide for potatoes. That's you. When should I start? So um, normally uh, January, February is when you want to start uh, getting a, a, at least spending some time, you know, uh, perking up your antenna for, for college-related stuff. So whether that's going on YouTube and starting to watch campus tours or uh, actually going to um, college websites and starting to kind of browse through, um, I think the junior year, second semester, is where you should start to kind of eyeball things. Um, the reason why is because usually by the time you get to your second semester, junior year, you have a general sense of how you're going to shape out by the end of June, July, before you apply um, a couple months later in your senior year. So um, there's a caveat to starting too early because we don't have enough of your academic and extracurricular data manifested to kind of be able to gauge and, and pinpoint where you'd go. Uh, but yeah, I think second semester, junior year, you should be able to project what you'll end up with and and hopefully that will turn out, and, and that's why getting a head start then would be the most ideal. Uh, obviously, uh, as you can see here below, you want to continue to evaluate and adapt a college list of yours all the way beyond even the end of your junior year. Uh, your AP scores won't be coming out until typically July, and I would argue that AP scores are, are, are pretty significant in, in, in many competitive circumstances. And then you'd also have a better understanding of what you'll end up doing for the summer and how that can maybe relate to how strongly you could write about your experiences for the uh, supplemental essays. Step one, um, I think you should start early in collaborating with your school and your counselor. I think uh, most schools, maybe like uh, Southern California public schools, will start asking students to fill out um, counselor recommendation packets, questionnaires. Maybe they delay that more towards February or March. Um, but, you know, if you go to a public school, that's something that you might want to use as a reason why you'd want to schedule a meeting with your counselor. Um, the other side of that would be for private schools. Um, I think the main thing for me about private schools is that sometimes they could have more of a heavy hand in how they um, uh, support their students. Uh, for example, a, a heavy-handed kind of thing could be the private schools uh, can tend to maybe discourage students from applying to a certain amount of colleges. Uh, some schools, um, I know there's a lot of international schools that I, I tussle with all the time uh, because they'll say things like, you can only have three reach schools or you can only apply to 10 colleges total. And I'll have a slide, I think I go into that next, about some of the, my thoughts on that. But um, having a good understanding of your school and how they will support you is obviously going to be important because one of the requirements is that your high school counselor um, is going to have to send your secondary school report. And along with that, the uh, counselor's recommendation. So um, I mentioned a note here, you want to be on the good side of your high school counselor. You don't want to come barging in the door demanding to speak with a manager, okay? <laughs> I've seen that happen too, and that could backfire um, on parents and students. Um, yeah, uh, don't, don't, don't be a Karen about college uh, applications with your high school counselor. Um, if they are being limiting in a way that's frustrating to you, it's still in your best favor to be patient, still in your best favor to try to um, get um, them to understand your situation and be on your good side. Uh, step two, do your research. Start early and start doing your research. Um, uh, links below is going to be a, uh, a spreadsheet kind of organizer for, for people to follow. It's not perfect for everyone the way I've structured it and the way I'm going to explain it at the end and how to use it. 
Um, but for the vast majority, it's a good starter guide. Again, talking with a professional, talking with someone who can give you more personalized advice is always going to net you um, uh, more, you know, um, I guess like effective advice about how you should structure your college list and how you should prepare. But yeah, do your research. Uh, U.S. News Rankings, go ahead and check out the uh, Research University tier list or the Liberal Arts College tier list that I recently posted and just start getting a hang of where you are academically in terms of your profile. Are you tier one, tier two, things of that nature, in addition to figuring out what you are looking for in a college. Um, because colleges can be a pretty expensive investment. And sometimes you may be going for the name value of a college, just going with the flow, only to realize that the rank didn't really matter as much to you as as much as maybe the research opportunities or or the particular localized industries that are more accessible to perhaps maybe a lower tier college um, there's a lot of things like that dual degree joint degrees i'm going to kind of briefly touch upon that and also obviously whether you vibe with the school you know you can't be going to uh, a school that you're going to feel miserable in right so Hopefully you guys, I mean, when I say you guys, I'm, I'm talking to students directly, uh, are starting to realize that this decision is, is, is a long-term one. It's four years potentially of your life that you're going to be spending there. Um, I did kind of break down research universities versus liberal arts colleges. That's definitely something you want to have um, a good understanding of. It's one of those things you should calibrate first. Am I interested in liberal arts or am I not? And I have a, a video that I posted uh, today. Actually, I focus more on this in the liberal arts tier listing video. So please check that out if you're interested in learning more. Financial aid. Um, yeah, financial aid. Uh, I'm, I'm not really going to go into this. I feel like I have to do the obligatory. I'm not certified. I don't do this kind of stuff. But um, if I had to give you a pointed direction, it'd actually be a Wikipedia link. Um, in fact, let me show you it real quick. Let's go to need blind. So if you just type that, first thing that shows up is need blind admissions. Um, they keep this up to date relatively. Of course, you might always want to double check a Wikipedia uh, source, but for the most part, I've been pretty happy with um, how the information has been conveyed um, over the years. But uh, the way you want to think about it is or the way you want to assess this is you want to start by reading the category. So you can see there are eight really good colleges up here. But uh, U.S. news institutions that are need blind and meet full demonstrated need for both U.S. and international students. So need blind, for the most part, is a good thing. It means like uh, whether you, every college will ask you in their applications, are you going to be applying for financial aid, yes or no? And depending on how you answer it, sometimes it could uh, adversely affect your chances. So need blind, whether you answer yes or no does not matter. So they are need blind in terms of the decision and will meet the full demonstrated need. And it's for US and international students. You'll see that's a key point because if you get to the second tier of colleges, US institutions that are need blind for US applicants and meet full demonstrated need. Notice how the international student has been dropped there. So if you're an international student and you are in need of financial aid, I hope you've been studying. I hope you've been grinding because these are the only schools that will, um, uh, if you say yes to in that question, are you going to apply for financial aid? These are the only schools for international students where they're going to be chill about it. They're going to not adversely affect your decision, uh, whichever way you go. Um, when you get to the third tier, You'll have U.S. news that are not need blind for applicants and meet full demonstration. So do you see right away, this is the key here. It says not need blind. So for some of these schools, yeah, they're basically saying that if you say, yes, I need financial aid, it could potentially adversely affect your decision. And you can kind of see the rest of how those shake out. But yeah, uh, back, to the, back to the main point. So financial aid, uh, you might want to start looking into this early. Jay, when should I be worried about paperwork and such? Oh, man. Uh, generally, financial aid paperwork is due alongside the deadlines of the application you're applying for. So if you're applying early, 
let's say November 1st, then usually it's around the same time. Um, but again, I, I would suggest that you look for additional resources to be sure about this angle. I'm not really going to cover this part too much. Start looking into specialized programs. There, This is one of those things where it gets really complicated, um, namely because while there is supposed to be a, a structured uh, vernacular of well, what is an accelerator, what is a dual, what is a joint degree, there's a lot of exceptions that are made all the time. And sometimes a school will use dual degree in one way, but then another school will use it another way. So it just, it's hard to explain as a result. But if you're thinking about, you know, accelerated medical programs, very famous one being like the BSMD program for Brown RISD or Rice Baylor. Um, Northwestern used to have one, but they discontinued, I think, a year or two ago. I remember having a meeting about that and for and forgetting to uh, verify that for, for a student. And I remember looking really foolish for not realizing that uh, for that year they, they discontinued the program. So if you're interested in things like this, again, uh, I'm not going to go into details about it. You probably want to talk with a professional. You might want to do your own Google searching. Uh, like, for example, for BSMD programs, there's a lot of websites that keep track of the, the programs that are out there. It's a really simple Google search, and you could see a lot of data that way. Um, there are things like the Berkeley MET program. It's Think of it as like management and technology combined. So it's kind of like a dual degree. Um, then there's the programs that are BSMS, which I think are super underrated. I feel like a lot of the international crowd really kind of knows things like um, um, Vagalos program at UPenn, you know, because the UPenn Wharton is extremely popular. Uh, and they'll know BSMDs, accelerated dental programs, like accelerated medical programs, accelerated pharmacy programs at UOP, uh, University of the Pacific. But then, like, really less discussed in relation to how I feel how great they are, are these BSMS programs. So, for example, a BSMS program could be something where you get a bachelor's degree of computer science, but then it'll then allow you to continue on into the graduate school and get a master's degree, um, just a straight pipeline. And there's a lot of questions and, and, and variants in this in, in, all, in these programs, whether you'll have to take a graduate school exam, such as the MCAT or the GRE or the GMAT or whatever the programs are. Um, so I would just leave this up to individual research. But yeah, just being aware that there are specialized programs and, and maybe that could be a perk that you should consider when you're considering your college list. There's also at the bottom here, dual campus, dual degree programs. Um, really popular, really hard to get in one would be like Yale National University of Singapore, Yale NUS, uh, Columbia Sciences Po. Sciences Po is a, uh, it's a conglomerate um, college system in France. And so you'll do like social sciences, study some of that, get a degree in social sciences through Sciences Po in France. And then, you know, maybe your third year, you'd, um, you'd transition to Columbia, New York, and then you'd finish off that degree with a, a sciences degree. So you'd have a dual degree in that way. Um, a lot of programs like those, much rarer that a student is aware of this and, and also wants to pursue this. So uh, something to maybe pique your interest and to look deeper into. Step three, you want to identify your academic and extracurricular tiers. Uh, you want to be realistic. Uh, I mentioned how you it, it doesn't make sense to create a college list as a ninth grader or even potentially even as a 10th grader. Uh, the reason why is because you haven't really shaped out enough yet in terms of your, your academic results and, and your extracurricular results. So um, academic and extracurricular tiers, I, I give a breakdown of academic tiers in the research university tier list video. Uh, there's a tab for the spreadsheet that I, I link in that video. Um, extracurricular tiers are much harder for me to, to, to explain, and uh, I have a future video to explain that planned. But yeah, knowing where you stand. Uh, are you a really competitive student? Are you top 5%? Are you top 1% of your school academically? Are your extracurriculars you know, super impressive and super unique? Or are they particularly potato and particularly vanilla? Um, these are the things you're going to have to start to assess. Um, number four, set your goals. 
So once you identify if you are tier one academically um, and activity wise, whatever your tier is, that's when you can start to gauge uh, what your expected goal should be. So for example, let's say you are a tier one student academically, but your activities are pretty vanilla. All you've done was orchestra and you're trying to apply as a bio pre-med major, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of missing elements there and it's a rather cliche thing to be. And so do you really think with tier one academics, um, you can then carry yourself into a school like, uh, you know, like Harvard, Stanford, Princeton with that. So um, hopefully people would know the answer to that. Uh, the answer to me would be obviously no, your activities are, are not really gonna be good enough for schools like that, even if you have tier one academics. And again, this is where maybe speaking with someone with experience can give you a better sense of how to, to calibrate your expectations. Uh, are you tier three academically, but aiming to build summer tier one activities? If that's the case, maybe you can go reaching for tier two schools, right? Or are you tier three academically and striving to reach tier one next semester? Maybe we can bank on the fact that with COVID, you could maybe give a, a, a legitimate excuse that maybe your parents were, 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 were hospital ridden and extremely ill and you just had to drop things in your 10th grade and your first semester of 11th. But uh, now that they've returned and gotten better, you are doing your best to grind out you know what you know you're capable of and you just come off with straight a second semester you are getting test scores ap's and sat scores that are also vindicating that high level of academic potential and then your activities on top of that are are amazing you do like a city of hope internship or um, you do a summer program that's extremely prestigious um, that becomes then a question of do i still have a chance to apply for tier one or am I being unrealistic and should I just settle for tier twos? Um, man, that's, that's hard for me to answer off the, off the top of my head because it really depends. It really depends on, on um, how good your activities are, how good of an explanation we can give for any falterings of your academics in the past. But yeah, setting goals. I put a note in here, it's never too late to get started. Just because you potatoed your, your ninth grade and 10th grade doesn't mean that you can only apply to potato colleges, okay? Um, sometimes you can have a redemption arc and I've seen students really pull that off each year. So um, set your goals and, and try to grind it out. Step five, figure out how many colleges you wanna apply for. Uh, on average, I would say you wanna apply to about 12 to 15 schools. I think that's the average I've, I've seen the common application, which is the main private school application that I see students using, there's also universal and coalition, but common app is kind of the OG, it's the original. Um, they allow you up to 20 colleges. Um, so I've seen students who have a game plan. We've set to, we agreed together that we'd go fishing in a sense for better colleges because we have this hope that things will improve and and we have expectations that maybe we can shine with our, our, our activities, then I'd say, you know, going up to a maximum of a 20 is, is common, it's, it's doable. Um, I've, I've, I've stood behind students and even recommended strongly for students to try it. Um, just because you never know which school you're gonna necessarily get accepted to. Um, with that being said, the, the third point here, students can mesh multiple application systems to go over the 20 mark, for example, you can try applying to the UCs. Let's say you got, you know, Berkeley, LA, San Diego, Irvine, Santa Barbara. Uh, you're applying to, let's say, six UCs. Um, that, those six, to me, doesn't count towards the 12 to 15 colleges that you're applying to, right? To me, in my mind, I think of it as UCs, however many they are, plus up to 20 colleges that the Common App will allow. And the reason why is because the UCs, again, have their own application system. You just have one application, you fill out four essays, right? And then you check mark which campus you'd like to send the application to. And each of the campuses will have their own set of questions for your major choice preferences, et cetera. So UCs plus 12 to 15, getting to around 20 total to max out on the Common App if you wanted to go fishing a little. Um, have I seen students do UCs plus over 20? Yes, I have. Um, gets a little bit more complicated because you're now kind of juggling multiple application systems like Coalition or Universal. 
uh, or maybe you're interested in universities in Texas. So they have the My Texas application, I believe. And so it could, again, range, but generally speaking, I think UCs, if you're a California resident, definitely UCs plus up to 20 colleges to max out on the Common App. 15 to 18 could be a good measure as well. I want to talk about this real briefly. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's some international schools that I tussle with because they are, uh, in my opinion, very ha heavy handed with uh, how many schools you can apply to. They'll say uh, you're applying to too many reach schools. You should only have three reach schools. Um, and they have, for the most part, some good initial reasons why they would stand behind that. So one of the reasons could be cost. Uh, each application nowadays is what, like 85 bucks a pop? So imagine if you went fishing U UCs plus up to 20, you know, do the math. You're, you're just in application fees, you're looking at almost $2,000, uh, not including also having to maybe send fees for transcripts and, and, and portfolios or whatnot. <laughs> to me, though, I think, you know, 85 bucks, it depends. It depends. But for me, $85 for, let's say, a 5% chance to reach school or a 10% chance to reach school, to me, can generally, most of the times, be worth it. Um, uh, obviously, it depends on, on family circumstances and um, the trajectory of the students, academics, and extracurriculars. But generally, I, I, I think that if you have a chance, a 5 to 10% chance of getting accepted to a school that's a tier higher than your expectation, you know, the $85 to give it a shot to me is a drop in the bucket. Um, the second reason why maybe a school would try to limit you though, oh, by the way, before I move on, I don't think it's necessarily up to the school to determine, to determine uh, whether it the cost is, should be the reason. I think that's up to your family, to your parents. So uh, I consider that reason to be nil. Um, the second is essay requirements. I hear this a lot. Hey, dude, this counselor J guy is crazy. He's suggesting if you want to go fishing to apply to 20 colleges, on average, a college will have, what, two, three supplements, 250 words each. That's like, oh my gosh, a bajillion essays you got to write. And definitely, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I would agree that that's a lot of essays, but if you've done this as long as I have, you'll realize that a lot of the essays tend to be recyclable and overlap. Describe a leadership experience. Describe one of your extracurricular activities in 150 words. Um, why major? Um, there's a point about that. Let's say a lot of colleges have a why major essay. Um, if you have major choice, you know, strat a major choice strategy that's that's uh, you know. Let's uh, just go with mainly biology throughout your entire application. If you're not mixing and matching your major strategy, and for some schools you're doing art, for other schools you're doing bio, for other schools you're doing environmental science. If you're doing something like that, I would honestly advise against it. I would argue that uh, it, it, only in rare exceptions do I see that being a good idea because um, one of the, the downsides of that is that you're going to have to be juggling a lot of different essay styles, essay responses, um, for me, it's lock in, you know, um, show a show a, a, an academic strength and an experiential strength towards that, and then have it so that you have one essay that can then be recycled, you know, edited a bit so that you can allow yourself to apply to uh, a wider range of colleges, a bigger basket. Essay requirements. As a result, if you start early and if you understand that they're recyclable and have a plan for it. Again, I don't think should be the reason why schools can legitimately say you can, you know, uh, we're going to limit how many schools you're going to apply to. So why do I think, what what is a legitimate reason why I think a school might want to limit how many you apply to? Um, I think it has to do more with kind of a macro versus individual question. So for example, uh, if you are... If you are trying to think of just the one individual student, right? Like I want to give this one Timmy the best chance of getting accepted to a top 10 school, then the argument generally is you should apply to all top 10 and see how they pan out. I don't think there's any disagreement to that. I feel like 
when when you're at the highest of levels, um, I, I wrote a note below that acceptances are not linear. So I've seen plenty of instances where a student gets accepted to Stanford, but then they get rejected from USC, right? There, what I mean by that is just because you have the and have you know you have the potential and have received acceptances at a higher tier school doesn't mean then all the lower tier schools therefore should follow suit right that that's a big misconception and misunderstanding that surprises parents and students when when the results start to come out um they could be reject lower lower tier schools could be rejecting you because of fit they could be rejecting you because i don't know the 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 they already chose someone for uh, the major or have a different student expectation or vibe or there could be many reasons why right one could be that you're overqualified they they know that one of the stats is retention rate or based on how many students they accept how many of those students were actually going to accept that offer and choose to go to the school you know some schools may even go as far as to say you're overqualified um, or maybe your major interest that you wrote about in your essay doesn't really fit with what they, uh, their major department particularly offers or specializes in compared to another student at your school. Um, lots of reasons why. So when you are aiming for top 10 schools, it makes sense as a result of that, your, your, your defense, your strategy is to apply to all of them. Um, that will give you the best potential results. So when a school is limiting you to, let's say, three reaches and, and something like that, uh, I think it's more because they realize that one student can take away the acceptances from all the other students, right? For example, let's say you go to a private school um, in Korea or, or, or in an international school there or, or somewhere, and you have this one superstar stud of a student and he applies to or she applies to all the Ivy Leagues and all the Ivy Leagues accept her. You remember, the Ivy Leagues aren't going to know who they're going to ultimately be able to, to get. And so they may give the acceptance to, let's say, two or three students total from one international school. And that would then mean... The student who the student who applied to all the Ivy Leagues, that student is taking up a potential spot from another student. Um, I hope that's making sense. Maybe I'll clarify in the descriptions. But uh, essentially, if you are playing the macro manager, if you're a school administrator and you wanted to give the biggest range of total acceptances for your for your high school because that's going to make you look good then it makes sense to to potentially limit students from just you know especially the super high level students from just fire sailing and applying to everything because they're going to gobble up all the limited acceptances and so uh, that to me becomes you know it's to me I, i think it's for sure it's speculation but I, I think that's really what's going on. And so my, my thought about that just then boils down to, am I vouching for the student or am I vouching for the school as a whole? And that becomes more the, the, the question here. Uh, I'm going to move on from that topic. Um, antiquated meta strategies. I've had, you know, um, students where they went to a high school where the counselor was much more older right in their in their 70s if not 80s and their understanding of college admissions has not been updated they haven't done any certification for for undergraduate counseling in recent years and so they have this very antiquated understanding of that and and how nowadays you can it's so competitive that again one of the best strategies you have is to is, is to apply to as many as you can cast a wide net so there's that issue and then lastly um, maybe a lot of uh, I see this a lot like the counselors will just take a snapshot like at a public school there's a you know you only have like what 30 minutes of meeting time with a high school counselor throughout your entire year if not entire four years at that public high school 
And so in a snapshot, they realize, oh, yeah, your grade's not good enough. Sorry, they're looking at some data uh, that they see and uh, maybe the last three, four years of acceptances. And they're not taking into account what you have planned for the summer. They're not taking into account that you have an excuse for, for maybe some mishaps with your academic grades. Um, you know, so uh, there's a lot of reasons why I think a school is going to has has the potential to maybe fumble. Um, giving you the optimal uh, college list recommendation. So just keep that in mind. All right, step six. So this is really the advice I wanted to, to jump to and give. I think that when you're creating a college list, you have, uh, you're, you're revealing your, your risk tolerance. So the, to, the super traditional conventional is the, is the rectangle. It's on the left. It's, you have a very balanced approach, five reach, five possible, five safety. Uh, many people have started to create a four-based, four-tier category, reach, possible, probable safety. That's also great, too, but I'm just going to keep things simple. Um, there's the high risk, which is the inverted triangle. Um, there's the mid-risk, so you're stacking more in the middle in terms of your tier p possibilities, uh, and then low risk. So let's, let's take an example. Let's say you're interested in high risk. Uh, you realize you have a tier two academic profile, you have a tier two extracurricular profile, but I have plans for this summer to do something that hopefully will help me shine, give me a major vision and experience set that I think will help me to go from a tier two activity to a tier one level activity kind of set, um, in which case I want to risk it. And so uh, let's use, let's apply to 10 tier one schools. Let's go with three or so possible um, tier twos. And then for safeties, let's go to tier threes. Usually you buttress the high risk. You kind of pull out an insurance policy on the high risk by applying for UCs. Remember UCs, it's just one application. So if you're a California resident, you have that, you have that insurance policy option where you can apply to all from UCLA all the way down to UC Riverside, UC Santa Cruz and Merced. And uh, you can make the argument, hey, Jay, if, if I don't get into you know, a tier three school like NYU or higher, I don't want to pay 60, 70 grand to go to a school that's lower ranked than that. I'd rather just go to UC Riverside and pay half the tuition, right? And that's a really good argument, I feel like. So um, finding where you are, what your bottom line is, right? At that point, I, I presented that bottom line being uh, anything lower than NYU. I'd rather just go to a UC school and pay half the tuition and maybe try to transfer or just grind out my undergraduate experience, you know, and then go for a, a better graduate school. Um, but these are the kind of four, four strats for, for mindsets and how you want to approach it. I've seen for the most part, uh, high risk and mid risk to be the way to go, it's, especially if you're a, a California resident and can use that, uh, the UC system to help you out. I don't think low risk makes any sense. If, if you are being recommended a low risk approach, I feel like there's something we could improve in terms of planning for your junior year and summer. Can we try to bring up your grades, academics, test scores, whatever it is? Can we start working on your activities? So if, if we have to resort to a low risk, I feel like something's already wrong there. So for me, it's, it's really about high risk. It's about balance, mid risk. Yeah. Um, build and bottom line consideration, uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, I feel like it makes sense to have a bottom line. Um, at a certain point, paying 60 grand a year to go to like a rank 100, rank 150 school, to me, I'm just going to be honest about it, it doesn't make sense, especially when there's so many alternatives. There's Cal States in California, there's Community College TAG program, TAG program sorry, Transfer Assurance Guarantee. You know, there's so many other things that you could consider for, to me, that's pound for pound, money for money. Uh, just It's just more reasonable. It makes more sense to me. So um, talking with a professional or someone who has experience to help you figure out what your bottom line would be um, and having a, a strategy and plan and therefore a college list built around that is going to be really helpful. Um, if you have no idea what your bottom line is, it's, it's much harder to develop a, a, a college list. So that's something you might want to talk to your parents with. And again, talk to someone who has experience in all this. So step seven, once you have a, a general sense of like how you want to apply and a general sense of your college list, 
uh, that's where you want to start mixing in questions about your early strategy. So there's many different kinds of earlies these days. I feel like I'm going to uh, hold on going deep into this and give a separate video about early strats and, and the different types of early programs. Um, but just know that you want to start considering earlies once you have a, a, a general sense of your college list um, because earlies can impact where you want to apply, right? So maybe I should give an example of this. So for example, let's say, um, you know, you your early strategy is to stack and do one early decision, let's say early decision to Columbia. And then you also want to add to that early action to Caltech MIT. Um, and these are all super rich schools, right? But then you have a high degree of confidence that, you know, if I applied early action to Georgia Tech, UIUC, uh, Purdue, then I would not need to have that many safeties. Maybe those could be my potential bottom lines, right? So coming back to bottom line. Um, if that becomes your thought, then the early, early application colleges you're considering then influence what your college list as a whole is going to look like. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that for now. Just know that earlies are not, you know, nothing burgers. Uh, they are going to be potentially influential in your overall college list strategy and, and build. So um, thinking about your earlies, learning about the earlies, the different kinds becomes very important. Last but not least, step eight, track your deadlines and requirements. Once you have a college list, once you figured out how you might play around with the early strategy for yourself, this is where you wanna start organizing all your deadlines and all the unique requirements. Remember some schools will ask you to submit your entire portfolio application you know two three weeks in advance of the early deadline or the regular deadline and if you miss out on those kinds of things it's not a good look it's not a good look to be missing deadlines on the on the get-go so um, FAFSA deadlines CSS that's for financial aid knowing what kind of recommendations are required even knowing what kind of subjects like class subjects you need to take I forgot to add that in here but yeah what kind of class subjects you need to take is also something that sometimes can catch a student off guard. They're, they're about to apply and then they look it up late and they realize, oh my goodness, I, I need one math recommendation letter and, and one humanities letter of recommendation. I, I don't have anyone for my humanities. And as a result, you don't meet the requirements. If you don't meet the requirements, you're not gonna be able to get in. You're not gonna be able to apply. So um, starting early to track these kinds of things. By the way, when you're tracking these kinds of things, um, Note that, yes, from, from year to year, a, a school's policy can change. Uh, for example, when it comes to early, a school can say, hey, we're, we did early decision last year, but this year we're going to change it to early action. Or this year we're going to offer both early decision and early action. When do colleges update these kinds of things? They're, they're, they're you know, final uh, information about deadlines, applications, restrictions, expect uh, requirements, usually around June or July. But the vast majority of them, they're not going to change that much. So if you just looked up previous year requirements and deadlines, you can assume that it'll be the same like 95% of the time. Final thoughts. Okay, college lists are highly personal and subject to many exceptions. I can't stress this enough. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know I'm trying to do the relatively the impossible here, which is to give kind of a one-size-fits-all general guide. And I, to a certain extent, I think the main takeaway of that that I hope to have achieved is, is to start early, do your research, realize that earlies may influence your chance, uh, influence your build, and to identify your risk tolerance, whether you more of a high risk and have a bottom line planned up, or you wanna go more with a balanced approach, understanding whether your high school counselor, your high school itself will have some sort of a heavy hand or say in it. All of that I think is important as a whole. But um, when it comes to the nitty gritty, the specifics, very subjective, very personal. Um, college lists are fluid and can change until the last minute. It's very common that to see for me that a student will change his or her early decision, you know, like two weeks before they apply. It's kind of it's kind of crazy that they do, but if their essays are all ready to go, you know, and and it's just a matter of switching, then maybe that's viable. Um, you have to be humble and realistic about your goals. 
can't imagine how many times I've, I've met with people, met with parents that have this high aspirations for their, their son or daughter. Yeah, we're talking about Stanford and Harvard, and then I look at the GPA and it's like a 3.4. Oh, how many times I've run into that. Um, so be humble, be realistic. Um, beggars can't be choosers. You know, that same story, maybe a 3.4 student says, I don't want to go to Stanford. I'd rather go to Harvard. You know, I just, what's that meme on the internet where it's that uh, Charlie Charlie Chocolate Factory guy, he's just staring at the kid like, yeah, sure, kid, sure. So beggars can't be choosers and don't be picky. Um, my rule of thumb is, for me, it's always been uh, to apply it to as many that you have a good idea for and a strategy for. And then once the results come out and all the results come out in March, for regulars at least, uh, from then to be picky and decide, uh, rather than being picky from the get-go. Because again, uh, admissions are not linear. Just because you get accepted to a higher tier doesn't guarantee you'll get to get accepted to all the schools that are lower. Uh, and then I wanted to go out of this and show you kind of uh, my resource for you guys. So let's say you wanted to get started building a college list. Um, I'm gonna link below kind of a general template that you could start with. Let's say you are a tier two student, so maybe tier two and tier three can be in the middle, and then you can have reaches in tier one. Maybe you are a tier three student, so maybe then you switch this to three, four, five, and six, and then your reaches can be in tier two, and then obviously you'd have to change the colleges there, but hopefully this will be a good starting organizational spreadsheet for y'all. Uh, keeping track of the deadlines. If you wanted to add other things here, uh, please feel free. Students, if you have not started using organi organizational spreadsheets, oh my gosh, like you're missing out. Honestly, if you struggle with organizing, start start getting the hang of using spreadsheets and stuff. Uh, if you see the tabs below, there's college information. So I went ahead and um, started kind of giving some basic things. You can change this to whatever you want it to be. You, maybe you don't care about location or size. Maybe you just want to start with cost and Maybe you really are concerned about how many teacher recommendations requires, are required. So instead of special programs, like whether they have a master's or, or, or an accelerated program, maybe you switch this to teacher requirements and you can make sure that you're being customized in, in, in your organization to, to what you need. Uh, but yeah, starting to research this early, gradually filling this out. By the time you get to essays, you know, in the summer, um, you're gonna have so much of a head start so much of a head start because a lot of the schools will ask you why college why our college why do you want to come to our college 250 words 100 word uh, some of them are, are 500 words 600 words so um, if you already have a general idea not of just the one college you're interested in but then the others as well then you're able to compare like you know one of the things is hey maybe you're interested in applying to usc but if you really wanted to truly be able to express why you want to go to USC over other schools, it makes sense that you also know what the offerings of the other schools are. That way you know what the differences are. So hopefully, you know, this could be a good organizational starting guide to get you going. And lastly, I put in a tab for essays. Um, the essays are prone to change. Uh, They'll refresh it. The colleges will announce when it's available for the 2022, 2023 year. Um, but if you, most of the times they don't change too much. And so if you wanted to get a head start, you definitely could try. And what I would do is you'd, you would Google, you know, name of the college and then prompts, right? And college essay advisors, really good. College Vine, really good. So you can kind of see what the questions were for the previous year. I want to caveat this. Sometimes they don't don't rely on these. Don't like they're great advice and they're usually pretty thorough. But I've had instances even this year where they missed a special essay because they're missing a major choice or or because based on the major choice, sometimes the type of essay that they ask you can change. So for example, here is you know USC supplemental essay prompt 2021-2022. Let's see if they have the engineering essay. See, they don't have it. So if you, if you applied it towards um, Viterbi Engineering, the Department for Engineering Majors, there's actually a separate essay that they ask. In fact, I found it on the other one. It's for engineers. 
it's either the 14 grand challenges or, or this other ch uh, this other question type. So um, don't 100% rely on third party sources because sometimes that can happen. But yeah, um, the advice they give is awesome. I, I'd say it would be amazing for me if, if my students actually began by, by reading through this first and then I would give them much more of the specialized advice or tips based on my experience and, and what I know about the student and what they're trying to do. Um, but hopefully this will be something useful for you if you're a student, for your son or daughter, if you're a parent. Um, get started. If you're a junior, like I said, nothing's stopping you on the weekends from, from starting to check out some schools, start learning about what their differences are based on their, their ethos, their philosophy, their mission statement, um, what kinds of essays they ask. It's, it doesn't hurt to get started. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much for joining in. This is a rather long-winded one. Of course, there's always going to be regrets every time I try to finish. I always feel like I'm missing or leaving out key points or, or making mistakes in terms of um, things I should have said, shouldn't have said. But uh, this is as raw as it gets for me. I hope that my advice is, is taken with that, that understanding that I'm trying to give an overview and, and of course, that there's always going to be exceptions and that if you, if you want to get more specific detail, it, it's always advantageous to, to talk with someone who has experience, to talk with a professional about it. But all right, thank you guys so much for your time and I hope this was helpful too.